In today's corporate landscape, everyone uses banks, whether it's to get loans, hold assets, or any other number of reasons. So what do you do when your bank cuts you off? Well, today's guest is going to tell you how to get loans for your private ventures without ever having to use a bank again. That's right. He's going to give you the tips, tricks, and tools to get access to private money lenders. Our guest will also tell you why the number one is the most dangerous number in all of business and why you can't fail at something until you quit. Keep it locked because you cannot afford to miss today's guest. Welcome to this edition of Peak, Peak Performers, Performers Podcast. Podcast with your host, Thor Conklin. Thor will be sharing the necessary tools, strategies, and psychology you'll need to, to become, become a peak, peak performer, performer in any area, area of, of your, your life, life or business. Thor Conklin here. We give you the tricks, the tips, the tools, the strategy, the technology, and the psychology peak performers use in order to get more done and execute at the highest level. If you know what to do but struggle with getting it all done, or simply want to raise your game to the next level, this podcast is for you. Sit back and enjoy. Today's guest is Jay Connor, private money authority and real estate legend. Jay specializes in using private money to help fund his real estate ventures, as well as teaching and mentoring up-and-coming real estate investors. If you're tired of dealing with banks, credit scores, and federal banking regulations, Jay has the inside scoop on how to fund your business ventures with private money. Jay, thank you very much for joining us today. This is going to be a fun episode. I love your background, and I love the space that you're playing in. Give us a little bit more detail about your backstory. Sure, Thor. Thank you so much for having me here on your show. Um, my wife, Carol Joy, and I, we live right here in eastern North Carolina. In fact, this is where I grew up. And I was raised in the mobile home or manufactured housing business. My father actually had the largest manufactured housing retailing company in the nation at one time. And so I was raised in the business of helping people own a home that ordinarily could not own one. Well, as time went on, uh, the retail financing pretty much went away for that product. Well, I knew if I ever got into uh, real estate or if I ever got out of the mobile home business, I wanted to get into investing in single-family houses, and I'll tell you why. We have just some dear friends in uh, still eastern North Carolina, Newburn, North Carolina, and their names are Craig and Kim. Now, this goes back to 1993. They wanted to build their first house, and they didn't have the down payment or the seed money to build their house. And so Kim's dad down in Florida was a full-time real estate investor, and she contacted him, told him what they wanted to do. Well, he said, I'll tell you what, I'll come up to Newburn, North Carolina. I'll buy you all a fixer-upper. Y'all can do the sweat equity during the week and on the weekends. And we'll sell a house, and you can pocket the profits, and that'll be the down payment for your house. Well, in less than 90 days, they did that, and they pocketed $30,000 in 90 days back in 1993 and at the time I was struggling I'm Thor I'm trying to make at the time three thousand dollars on a single wide yeah so they 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 gave me the motivation to do something different if I ever got out of the mobile home business which we did so this was 14 years ago Thor I started looking for my first single-family house that I could flip I hadn't gone to any seminars. I hadn't gotten a mentor or a coach at the time. I'd read a, a couple of books on it. And so I, I, I learned that I was supposed to find the ugliest, nastiest smelling house I could find at a good price. And <laughs> back then they had actually these things called monthly homes magazines where the realtors would actually publish a monthly publication with all of their listings. And so I looked for the ugliest house I could find. Well, my wife, Carol Joy, will attest to you today, I found it. So (laughs) (laughs) this house had been shown over 60 times. It had been in multiple listings for nine months. It was over off of 20th Street in Moorhead City. So I put that house under contract. I was so excited. So I got Carol Joy in the car with me. I said, babe, you got to go see this house that I got under contract to buy. By the way, back then, 14 years ago, as you know, if you could fog a mirror 
you yeah. could get financing. I mean, and it just, seems like it's coming back too. It is coming back. I know, which is crazy. Oh my word! Oh my word! The thing that got us in that situation, yeah. I've got some lenders right now for the buyers of my houses. I mean, for a mid score of less than five hundred eighty, they haven't done the the. Uh, well, they, it is sort of a stated income. You don't even have to show a W-2. But anyway, don't let me digress. So anyway, <laughs> right. anyway so Carol Joy rides with me to see this house, Thor. And bless her heart, she wouldn't even get out of the car to go in and look at this house. She's looking at the neighbors. She's looking at the neighborhood. And I said, well, to be sure, my dad will go look at this house with me. So I take dad out there to look at the house. He gets out of the car, but he ain't saying a word. We opened the front door. Bear in mind, I haven't bought it. Uh, it's under contract. You have to step over stuff. It sort of does make you want to gag. And he, my dad looks at me and he has son, have you lost your mind? <laughs> so I didn't have very much encouragement on the very start of this venture. So anyway, long story short, I had an unsecured line of credit at the bank. I bought it for 50 I put another 50 in it. And in less than 60 days, we flipped it and we pocketed $40,000 in profit. And I decided I like this business. Well, quickly, let me fast forward. The first six years of my investing, of me investing in single family houses, it was all funded through lines of credit at the bank. I called up my banker eight and a half years ago, and I had two deals under contract, two houses, there's this dead silence on the other end of the phone. My banker, whose name was Steve, notice the operative word is was Steve. I called him up. There's dead silence. He clears his throat. And I told him I had these two deals in the contract, over $100,000 in equity and profits. He clears his throat and he says, Jay, I'm sorry, but the bank has collapsed your line of credit. Well, I never heard of a line of credit being collapsed, but I knew it didn't sound good. I said, what do you mean? My line of credit is collapsed. He said, well, the bank is just not loaning money out to real estate investors anymore these days. My first thought was, it sure would have been nice to have known that before I got cut off. And secondly, what am I going to do? Well, my definition of coincidence is God's way of staying anonymous. In less than two weeks, I was introduced to this wonderful world of private money where I don't rely on banks, don't rely on credit score, et cetera. We'll talk more about that if you want to. And I was able to fund those two deals. And since that time, Thor, in the past eight and a half years, I've never missed out on a deal because I did not have the money. That is an incredible story. You know, the first thing you said when it was the nastiest, smelliest house you could find, the first thing I was thinking of, either mold or like a dead body. You gotta be careful yeah. with you gotta be careful with that system. <laughs> That's true. That's true. However, houses these days with mold, I'm actually attracted to them because it runs a lot of real estate investors off. Yeah, good point. Now I want to get into a couple things first. Your dad being in business, what were the the nuggets that you got from him growing up? Oh my word, my dad taught me more about being an entrepreneur. Entrepreneur and being, uh, and more about being a business person and being business for yourself than anybody else on the planet. One of the biggest things he taught me was, yes, do your research, study your deal, study your venture that you want to go into, but stop on analyzing it. If it's a good deal, pull the trigger. That's the biggest thing that uh, I've discovered that keeps people from being successful. Take action on what you know to be, you know, I mean, what's the worst thing that could happen? You know, I can't lose what I don't have, right? Mm -hmm. So take action on what I have learned or what I know to be a good deal. Another big lesson my dad taught me was the power of automation. Dad was known as the 3D man, which stands for dictate, delegate, and disappear. <laughs> so, <laughs> and of course, don't forget the fourth part, and that's show back up when they least expect you. Um, I didn't really come to really learn that lesson <laughs> until about seven years ago. You know, I'm a guy, right? Yeah. So if you're a guy, nobody else can do it better than you can, right? Correct. Well, wrong. 
Most people can do it better than I can. <laughs> I learned that. I learned the hard way. And so, I mean, I'll never forget one night, my wife, Carol Joy, and I, we were at Lowe's Home Improvement oh, seven, eight years ago. And we're picking out light fixtures and blinds and little staging items for a house. And I thought to myself, what in the world am I doing picking out light fixtures? Can somebody else not do that? And so I set out on a mission to actually automate and systematize everything in our business. And so my goal, which it took me about 18 months to get to, my goal was to get to the point to where the only thing I do in my business is make decisions. I can be looking at a property lead sheet from a seller that's motivated and decide what do I want to offer on that house, if anything. So I went out setting to build an amazing team that really helps us run this business. So we got an interior designer that chooses all the colors, the paint colors, the carpet. What are they going to do to the cabinets? In fact, I just got back home yesterday from speaking at another real estate investing conference. And in my email, I received an email from one of my contractors that rehabs the properties. And he had met the interior designer, Beth Garner, there at the house. They sent me a spreadsheet. All I'm interested in is the bottom line. What's it going to cost me to get it done and how long is it going to take? Whereas before, that process might have taken me a couple of weeks. Now today, because of automation, I'm able to make that decision in less than 30 seconds. Yeah, so, so, so important. You know, and delegation, so many people get delegation wrong. Delegation is not about handing something over and then removing yourself and not being involved in the process. You don't even have to get it done 100%, but if you can give it to someone who's doing something in their genius and they can even take it 80% or 90%, it moves it down the road. So, so important. And so many entrepreneurs get stuck in this. It's got to, if it's to be, it's up to me. Don't get stuck there. Exactly. I could not agree more. And, you know, I mean, I'm serious. So many of the minutia tasks that I was doing, actually somebody else can do better. Yeah. And so part of my automation in the business is I only do what I enjoy doing. I mean, isn't that what we're looking for is the lifestyle and the wealth that our business gives us. So I only do what I enjoy doing and I outsource the rest. Absolutely. I want to dive in a little bit, and this is one of the things that I really, really like about your brand is it doesn't say Jay Connor, the real estate guru. I know everything. I'm into everything. Very specifically, the private money authority, a lasered focused approach on one aspect of the real estate market. Tell us how you ended up in that lane. Yeah, Absolutely. And you're right. I mean, you know, in your business, you got to know all about it from A to Z. But when it comes to training and teaching and motivating other people that want to do the business like you, I've discovered you really need to be focused. And so, as I just shared a moment ago, the reason I got involved in private money is because I was cut off from the banks with no notice. And at the time, and still today, I mean, we have an 800 credit score, very good credit, never late on payments. But I found myself in a situation, and for, you probably have heard of the name Dan Kennedy, yes. who is just a genius, a genius in articulating and helping other people in the world of information marketing. So Dan is one of my mentors, and I learned from Dan that the most dangerous number in any business is the number one, the number one. And what he means by that is having all of your eggs in one basket. So, back to the private money, okay? I had all of my eggs in one basket by relying on one lender, one bank, to fund my deals. Well, today, Carol Joy and I have 45 different private lenders that are funding our deals. So, I could lose over half of my lending sources and still not stop moving forward whatsoever. So back to this niche. I was cut off from the banks. I learned and heard about private money. I put it on steroids. I was able to go out and get over $2 million 
in funding for my deals in less than 90 days. So my banker actually did me a huge favor, Thor, by cutting me off. I mean, I would have never probably paid attention to the phrase private money and what it is and how to go get the funding using private money unless I had been faced with this very, very difficult challenge of being cut off from my funding. So there's another big lesson in the world of entrepreneurs, and that is you cannot fail until you quit, okay? So when I was cut off from the banks, that was not a choice for me. I'm not going to fail at this. We're just going to look for a different and better way to get our funding. And so just so we're all clear, when I say private money, and if the, you know anybody that's been in real estate investing, you may have heard of hard money, okay? You may have heard of hard money lenders. In fact, this expo I was speaking at in Raleigh, North Carolina this past weekend, there were a lot of hard money lenders at the expo. But I'm not talking about hard money. What I do and what I teach thousands of students of mine across the nation has got nothing to do with hard money. It's actually doing business going directly to the source going to individuals that that you work with directly on uh, funding your deals. So really, Thor, it was a huge blessing in disguise, okay? What, what year was blessing. that? That was, okay, let's go back. So that was eight years ago. So that was 2000, that was January of 2009, okay? So the spigot had already started to be cut off from a lot of real estate investors. It just showed up to me <laughs> yeah. at the very, I mean, a lot were cut off in 2007, 2008, particularly. And I think to tell you the truth, the bank that I was getting my funding from had their year in review of 2008. And I was notified in January of 2009, uh, you know, 2008 wasn't too good for us and from real estate investors. We don't want any more of that right now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And, and if you're listening to this show and you think everything's great now and it's going to continue to be great, be careful because it, we could very easily find ourselves back there where if you have a line of credit right now, in a year from now, you may not have that line of credit. There's That's a lot, right. A lot of That's things right. are, are percolating behind the scenes that could recreate, maybe not that the entire scenario, but, you know, banks change their lending practices. Absolutely. And, 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 you know, as you just mentioned a moment ago, Thor, I mean, there's lending practices right now. There are loans that, see, I, I sell a lot of houses on rent to own or with lease option, lease purchase, to where people can go ahead and move into one of our homes that's been fully renovated, looks brand new, and but their mortgage, their, their credit score will not allow them to get a mortgage. So we'll sell them on rent to own. They get to enjoy the house, but we just haven't transferred the title yet. Uh, we require them to come to our credit program and get them ready for a mortgage in six months to a year. But here's the point. Because of that program, I see a lot of our, my buyers now taking advantage of getting loans without verification of income. Did you know there's loans out there right now that new homeowners can get? that they do not have to give a W-2 or a check stub or even tax returns, they can show copies of their bank statements for the past six months or 12 months. And if they have enough money coming in and out of their bank statement, the lender says, good enough for us. Your credit score is good enough. Let's close the loan. So yeah, all it, that, all, <laughs> it's crazy. All that's fantastic for, for, you know, for cashing out. But like you just said, don't count on that. I mean, one of the biggest lessons I've learned, one of the biggest mistakes that I have had in real estate investing is I bought the house or property predicated on the market continuing to go up and not even stay flat. And knowing at the time that that property would not cash flow itself if I had to rent it out and not flip it, big mistake. So I've learned over the years, my intention on a property may be to flip it but I cannot buy it unless the rent that I bring in, if I have to rent it, will pay for my carrying costs that I've got invested in it. 
That is, so many people avoid that advice, and it's so simple, isn't it? Yes. Everybody yeah, wants to the see hard- the upside. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> I learned it the hard way. I learned it the hard way. You know, so learn from somebody that's lost a lot of money and don't make the same mistake. <laughs> exactly. I I always say that that a, a smart person will uh, make mistakes and learn from their mistakes. A genius sees other people make mistakes and don't do those. You got that right. <laughs> I'm not at the genius level yet. I'm a smart guy. I usually learn from my mistakes, but I usually have to go through them myself. Mm, well, don't cut yourself short. I think you may be otherwise. You just don't know you're there yet. Yeah, that's that's true. <laughs> I'll, I'll underplay it a little bit. I, I like my uh, humility. <laughs> there you go. There you go. Thank you so much for listening today. I really do appreciate your time, and I hope you found today's show valuable. If you would like to receive these shows automatically, to your phone or to your computer, simply go to iTunes and subscribe. After listening to several of the shows, if you're so inclined, please leave us a five-star rating as this helps us reach additional people and spread the message. If you're truly committed to taking your life to the next level and doing whatever it takes to become a peak performer, but something's holding you back, something is blocking your way, and you just can't seem to figure out what it is, send me an email to info at thorconklin.com And I'd be more than happy to get on the phone with you. We'll schedule a 15-minute discovery call. No obligation, no cost. I absolutely love to hear from the listeners. And if there's something I can do to help, I'd be more than happy to do that. Also, if you found something of great interest in today's show and you want to share that with your friends and family, simply go to my Facebook page, Thor Conklin. Click on the episode, hit the share button, and share it on your page. You can follow me at Twitter at Thor Conklin. The website is ThorConklin.com. We're constantly adding new free resources, discussing additional tricks, tips, tools, and strategies on how to be a peak performer. Remember, I try to keep these episodes short so you can listen to them during dot time, doing other things, commuting, driving, walking, working out. Decide to be a peak performer in all that you do. And until tomorrow, have an absolutely amazing day. Stay tuned for part two of our conversation with Jay, where he tells us why finding your why is essential to being successful. He also tells us the three things to help you determine what to say yes to. See you next time on Peak Performers Podcast.